Well, let me add my welcome uh, to you. I'm going to be carrying us through our teaching time uh, tonight. And uh, so welcome to my church family. Uh, to those of you who are visiting, what an honor it is to have you spend this time. Also want to welcome those of you who will hear this across the street, uh, as well as those who will be joining us in any other way. I've been so grateful for what Mark has spoken to us about God's love over the last few weeks. Has this series been helpful to you? Has it, has, yeah, it's been incredible. It has, uh, it, it has challenged me as well as encouraged me uh, to want to grow in my quality and capacity of love. I want to love better, and I want to love more. When I was growing up in Texas, I heard an old love song by a country singer that expresses what, what our love can sometimes sound like or be experienced as. This song said it like this, I love leaves in the wind, pictures of my friends, birds of the world, and squirrels. I love coffee in a cup, little fuzzy pups, bourbon in a glass, and grass. And I love you too. <laughs> Is that incredible? <laughs> Listen to these other lyrics. I love little baby ducks, old pickup trucks, tomatoes on the vine, and onions. And I love you too. That's the way that it's got to be the worst love song ever <laughs> written. Now, most of us know the difference between loving onions and loving one another. But most of us also know that at some point, something or someone is going to test the quality, and the limits of our love. And so we've been camped out in what God's Word says about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this, this love chapter, wanting to discover how God desires for our, our capacity to love to grow. And so I want to read those words together again so that we can continue to learn from them. Beginning in verse 4, Paul writes this, that love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Now, I cannot read those words without realizing that if that is love, then I have a lot of growing to do. We don't just start out ready to love like that. We have to learn how. And Paul is going to tell us that our temptation will always be to try and compensate for immature love with lesser things that look impressive. And so look what he says after he defines love in that way. He says to them, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, those are all the things that they were impressed with in Corinth. He says they will become uh, useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, Paul says, I love this analogy, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. 
But when I grew up, that's what we want to do with love. I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial. It's incomplete. But then I'll know everything completely just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And here's the lesson we've been learning. The greatest of these is love. And so I want us to consider, as Paul puts it, how we can grow up and mature our quality and capacity to love. I did a funeral years ago for a man who had passed away in his 80s, had lived a long life. His wife had passed away many years before him. And so I met with his two sons, each men in their 50s. To plan his funeral, we got together and, and, uh, to talk. I didn't know the family, and so I assumed that these two sons would have some ideas of how they wanted to honor and remember their dad. And I was surprised to find when we met to plan the funeral that each son told me in no uncertain terms that they did not want to plan anything for him. They wanted the bare minimum done to get it over with. They said he was a horrible father, a miserable man, and we do not have a happy memory of him. Can you imagine? So I planned a very simple funeral service assuming that there would not be a large attendance for this guy. And that's when I was surprised again when on the day of the funeral, which was in this room, this room was more than half full in attendance. And a parade of people came down front here to talk to the sons before and after the service. And I remember sitting and listening, because I was close by, listening to what people said to them about their dad. And they said things like this, he was an outstanding businessman, they said to his sons. They said there are buildings all over the city because this man was in construction. They said buildings all over the city stand as a testament to the quality of work that set your dad apart. They came down and they, they, I remember one saying no one was better at the old lathe and plaster construction uh, that their father was involved in. He said everyone knew their dad and they said that everyone knew they could count on their father to give a top quality product in the end. I remember some younger men about the age of those sons coming down and they were peers. They had grown up together and they said things like this. I remember your dad was my little league baseball coach and oh, what a great coach he was. He really knew the game of baseball. And I listened and watched as these two sons nodded and received all those compliments with a polite wince in their eyes as if every compliment was a reminder to them of the lesser things their father prized over love. Lesser things, no matter how impressive, will never compensate for small love. We see this in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We see a church that is so impressed with themselves and they have forgotten that none of it compares with how they love. In fact, in chapter 1, at the beginning of the letter, you have it in your bulletin. He compliments, Paul compliments these people saying, I always thank God for you. 
and for the gracious gifts He's given you. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus, through Him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says you are an impressive bunch of people who excel in many, many ways. But then in chapter 3, the tune changes. He says to these same guys, dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world, like, like you were little babies in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And he says, and you still aren't ready. They looked amazing on the surface because they compensated for immature love with impressive displays. But Paul says, you've got a lot of growing up to do. In my own life, being a parent has been God's favorite classroom to teach me about love. No education, no degree from any institution or any other quality or skill can compensate for the limitations of my love. Not because I don't love my kids. I do love them. I I truly, genuinely enjoy my kids. I I could even say I like my kids. (laughs) And yet, like nothing else, being a parent has tested the maturity of my love. Being a parent tests my patience and my kindness and my irritability and my endurance. And my kids know this. I can't impress them with anything that compares to love. What tests your love? What tests the maturity of your love? If you don't know what exposes the immaturity of your love, I guarantee you some others do that you could probably ask. Maybe you need God's help to grow up in love in your workplace. Maybe your love gets tested in your marriage or in your singleness. Maybe your love was tested in the family you grew up in or by by great losses that you have endured. Maybe it's been in friendships or in church where you've needed God's help to grow up in love. I know some of you have had your love tested so that loving looks like fighting to love sometimes. Your love has been tested by people who broke your heart, who disappointed you and betrayed you. And some of you have been so childish with love and made such regrettable mistakes that you wonder if you're really capable of loving or being loved. My love gets tested when friendship gets difficult. When someone's mental illness or addictions makes things complicated for me, my love gets tested. When people don't agree with me, my love can get tested by big challenges in life and by stupid, piddly little things. My love can get tested in line at the DMV. (laughs) And I don't know if maybe I'm just preaching this sermon for me this weekend. Or if you recognize the need for your love to grow, I, I want to grow up in my love. And so I want to offer you something that's been helpful to me. It's, it's nothing new. In fact, it's very old. About a thousand years ago, there was a young man who heard the gospel, was convinced to devote the rest of his life to serve and follow Jesus. And he had a profound impact on his generation. His name was Bernard of Clairvaux, and he wrote a book called On Loving, in which he identified four ways that Jesus enables us to grow in our love. 
And these, these four ways of loving, he called them four degrees of love that we can learn to enter into, that we can grow into. And this has been a, a, a tool that I have used in my life to assess the maturity of my love and to pray for God to help me to grow in my love. So I want to share with you Bernard's four degrees of love. You ready? First degree of love. Bernard said, here's where we all start. I love myself for my sake. That's where we all begin. I love myself for my sake. That means I'm looking for what will benefit me and I'm looking to myself to get it. This is is the lowest degree that we all kind of learn to love like this. I'm master of my domain, captain of my destiny. Now, you might not go around telling people you love yourself, but at the end of the day, everyone around you knows and you know that the most important person to you is you. In this first degree of love, uh, I define love as pleasing me. Love is you doing what I ask when I ask for it. Love is you letting me speak my mind and then agreeing with me. Love is you not having something that I don't get to have. Love is you making sure I feel good about myself. Love doesn't wait around for you to get your act together. Love means finding someone else who doesn't have such a long record of faults. Love should feel good to me no matter what. And in this first degree of love, my love can be retracted, repealed, and replaced in whatever circumstances suit me. In this first degree of love, we interpret anything that's self-serving to be love. That's how we get confused about love. And we confuse other things like preference and lust for love. That's how love ends up cheap and casual. That's how we end up looking for love in all the wrong places. And we all start out loving ourselves for our sake because we all start out as children. Not one of my children showed up in this world asking how he or she could contribute to the family. (laughs) But we know, we know that this kind of stunted love it will not reach far or last long or accomplish much. And I can either deny the limits of my love and try to compensate by impressing you with other things or I can recognize that I need, I need a source of greater love beyond myself to lo- help me love greater. I need God's help. Only with God's help will I grow beyond loving myself for my sake. The second degree of love, Bernard said, begins when we recognize that, when we turn to God and we say, here's the limits of my love, God, but I am trusting you to do more with me. The second degree of love sounds like this, loving God for my sake. So we went from loving myself for my sake to loving God for my sake. I turn to God and I trust Him to do with me what I can't do on my own. I love and trust and hope in God for all that He will do for me. I love Him because of His mercy and I love Him because He first loved me. I love Him because when I was dead in my sin, He gave me life by the power that raised Jesus from the dead. I love Him for all He's done for me and does for me. And that's not a bad place to be. That is a good place to be. That is the beginning of life with Almighty God. That is how we come to faith in Jesus to realize that we need Him and the salvation He offers. When you come to the realization of your need and the riches of God's grace offered to you through Jesus Christ, 
And you respond to that in faith. You begin to grow up in love. I guarantee that if you continue in that faith, your love for others will grow. You'll realize that what Jesus did for you, He did for others too. As you need Jesus, they need Jesus too. As you are forgiven, they need forgiveness too. The second degree of love is a recognition that we aren't complete without Jesus. We aren't whole. We aren't what we ought to be without Him. And in this degree of love, I learn to express my gratitude to God and to trust Him and to confess sins to Him and c- confess my I need to God and I begin to experience His mercy and His grace and my love starts growing up. My love is getting bigger. But there is still a kind of self-directed aspect to this second degree of love. Loving God for my sake means I'm still primarily concerned with what God is doing for me. And it's not a bad place to be, as I say. It's the beginning of life with Jesus. But Jesus has more of life and love for us. And so Bernard says there's a third degree of love that we grow into. And he identifies this third degree of love like this. Loving God for God's sake. We went from loving myself to, for my sake to loving God for my sake. But this third degree of love is loving God for God's sake. Not just for what God does for me, but love for God because He's God. He is worthy of my love. He is worthy to be adored He's God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. And old hymn says, this is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King. Let the heavens ring. God reigns and let the earth be glad. I just, I just love Him because He is Almighty God. This third degree of love is love for God because He's more wonderful than you can ever imagine. When I think of God Almighty revealing Himself through nature and through His Word and through His Son and being present and powerful among us with His Holy Spirit, how can I put into adequate words how worthy He is to be loved and worshipped and adored? Do you know that we are not entitled to anything God has done for us. And if He never did another thing for you and me, He would still be worthy of all our breath and praise and adoration because He's God. And I agree with Bernard that loving God for God's sake like this is not a grade school kind of love. It's a love that's got to mature to see beyond the gifts of God that He offers and to gaze upon His beauty and to love Him with awesome reference for who He is. That kind of love takes time to mature. Some of you know what I mean. You can just get caught up in awe about Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. And it's true that in that degree of love, our love grows again. We begin to see the dignity and beauty and value in others because they too were made in the image of the God I worship. My love for God makes me want to love what He loves. His mercy makes me want to show mercy like He does. The fact that he, he became a servant. I want to serve who He was willing to serve when He gave up heaven and came and gave His life for us. That's the maturity of love in the third degree. And Bernard has one more. This fourth degree of love. And honestly, this fourth degree of love, when I first heard it, it sounded kind of shocking to me. Almost dangerous. And I want you to understand that the fourth degree is this. Loving myself for God's sake. Loving myself for God's sake. 
beyond loving myself for my sake, beyond loving God for my sake, beyond loving God for God's sake, I can love myself for God's sake. It sounds problematic because the self has reemerged, but I'm talking about the power of the resurrection at work in you and me. This is, this is love that flows out of me by reliance upon the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to empower you and me to love like Jesus loves. Loving myself for God's sake is a kind of commitment, a contentment, a restfulness in knowing what God says about me. It is a, it's receiving so much love for me from God that I'm not concerned about me anymore. I'm freed up from all those concerns. I'm so loved by God. I'm just able to love you with greater concern. I'm not worried about me. I am so free of concern for myself that I have more room to love you. This is an assurance of God's love for me that strengthens my faith and compels me outward to live with confidence in God's love for those who don't yet know Him. In another letter, Paul wrote to these same people in Corinth and he kind of picks up this same topic of, 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 of not being so impressed with one another. He says in the second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 5, We've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know Him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. In other words, I'm so confident in the power of the resurrection that I'm going to love you with anticipation of what God is able to do with you. Bernard describes this as being like metal that has been so heated in a fire that the metal begins to glow to the point that you can't tell where the fire stopped and the metal began. I want to learn to love so that my love looks like the one who has loved me with a never-ending love. Love at this degree never concludes that my love has limits because I know that the Spirit of God is able to break through every limit. His love will never end. In this fourth degree, I'm not looking for impressive distractions to compensate for my limited love. I'm yielded in humility like an instrument in God's hand for God to love others through me. In this other letter to the Corinthians, this second one, Paul tells us about a great frustration in his life, something that was irritating to him, something that made it hard for him to love. He was bothered by it. He calls it a, a thorn in his flesh. And he tells us that he prayed and he prayed and he prayed for God to take this irritation out of his life. But then Paul tells us that after praying and praying and praying, God said to him, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. And Paul says, now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure, he says, in my weaknesses and in the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I'm counting all my self-promoting achievements as loss in comparison to what God has produced in me by grace. There is a yielding to God and an obedience that finds joy and surrender. This kind of love 
takes time and trials and risk and faith until I am so filled with the love of God that I'm not reaching for anything to prove myself. I'm confident that the greatest thing about me is God's love for me. And it is so abundant and so powerful that I want to show that love to you. Alex, would you come and join me as we come to a close? Wouldn't it be nice if everyone was just easy to love? (laughs) Why can't everyone just make it easy for me to love them? Lindsay got me a t-shirt last year she found on the internet. I told her I wanted to wear it tonight. But it says across the front of it, why are y'all trying to test the Jesus in me? (laughs) Why is it so hard to love sometimes? Because love is so much bigger. Love isn't mastered in kindergarten. It's a long, long pursuit aimed at the highest peak of human experience. Love is the very essence of who God is and so it requires His help for us to really love. And so the more you are filled with God's love for you, the bigger your love grows for others. When you find your love tested, remember that Jesus has opened to us the kingdom of God and all the riches of God's love have been made available to you. He loves you. And He wants to fill you with His love to the point that there's nothing greater about you that can spill out onto others. I want that to be true of me. That's the kind of church that we want to be where people say, that church, that that church in Eagle Rock, they are welcoming. That church is a church that has faith for God to do remarkable things. That church is so generous. They give and they give big and the music is outstanding and the people are friendly. The parking's not great. But... (laughs) But you know what they do best? They love. The greatest thing about them is how they love. Because the greatest thing that we have to give to this world is how much God loves you. There's nothing greater. And so... Join me, if you would, to ask God to help us. Help us love. If you're here this weekend and you, you've never gotten past just looking out for me, but you know you've reached a limit and you need a greater source of love in your life. If you have never received Jesus' love for you and begun a new life with God, now is the time. There is no better time than right now to start a new life with the God who loves you. And you can do that right here, right now. We're going to worship in just a minute before we get out of here. And as we worship, if you want to say yes to Jesus, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And then I want you to fill out a card that's in the seat back in front of you. You can just drop it off at the new people's table on your way out. And it's just a way of saying, Matt, I said yes to Jesus. I started a new life with God. And I want to follow up with you. The rest of us that know little tastes and flavors and and maybe even floods of His love, let's just worship before we get out of here and ask Him to help us to love with His love. Would you stand with me and let's pray before we sing. Father, I love what Anahita said that there was such joy in in knowing that she could call you Father. 
that you, God, want to be in this personal relationship with us, to love us deeply and personally, to love us with a love that cares for us and strengthens us and supports us. And God, we want to be a church that grows in our quality and in our capacity to love. Help us with that, I pray. I pray for my friends who are here tonight who are crossing a line of faith to say, I'm, I'm starting a new life with God. I'm saying yes to Jesus. I'm accepting Him as the Lord of my life, as my Savior. And if that's you, just take a minute and say to Him, Lord, I need You. Thank You for what You have done for me. I accept You, Jesus. I receive you as the Lord of my life. Forgive me for a life that did not honor you. Forgive me for my sins. I want a new life with you. In Jesus' name. And we can all say together, amen.